All right. Well, hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be doing this webinar. Um, spent a lot of time putting this together. And um, it's funny, I hadn't realized how much I've actually thought about um, connected scripts and how everything works. And, and uh, so it was, it was nice to kind of put things together and, and kind of clarify things in my own mind. So uh, you know what they always say about, um, about teaching is that you end up learning quite a bit yourself. So I would say that that's absolutely true. Um, at the end of this, uh, and this is something I'd mentioned to Jimmy um, earlier this morning, um, anytime that I've done lettering workshops, I have, um, you know, opened up my computer and cracked open some of my files, you know, my, my font lab files and my Photoshop files and shown people sort of the behind the scenes. So I have pulled a couple of things out um, and people love that, by the way. So, I, you know, I thought maybe that would be interesting. So if any of you are curious as to see, you know, how I do things and maybe want to take a look at some of my files, let's do it. So, all right, with no further ado, time to turn off the, the cam, Jimmy? Yeah, I would. All right, yeah. here we go. The Connected Scripts webinar with Font Lab and me, Laura Worthington. I'll be covering a lot of information in this webinar, and I have to admit, I tend to talk really fast. I try to slow it down, but it doesn't always work out that way. So if you're planning on taking notes, I just want to let you know that you can watch this webinar again. And I'll also provide a, a PDF of this to anyone who wants it. Uh, just send an email to hello at lauraworthingtontype.com. So let's go over what's covered in this webinar. We're going to be talking about different script styles, connected versus semi-connected scripts, using ligatures and contextual alternates, and of course, you know, what are those things? Uh, conundrums, challenges, and solutions, optical adjustments, control characters, and I'll also be doing a little how-to and showing you exactly my process of making a connected script base. So let's go over some definitions of terms used in this webinar. I'd like to start by defining a few terms so we're all on the same page as we go through this. The first two terms should sound pretty familiar, but they each carry different meanings. And I'm going to be using them a bit loosely in more of a colloquial sense than the exact dictionary definition, which could take us into a much longer discourse on lettering history. So here they are. The first one is cursive. And this refers to flowing strokes with most or all letters joined. You see this style a lot in formal scripts and handwriting. It was developed in the 1600s and rose to its height of popularity in the 1700s to early 1900s. First with the round hand model, also called copper plate, and later with Spencerian. The purpose of these two primary lettering models was to create a standard universal writing style that would be both recognizable and efficient. Italics. I'll be using this term to refer to Roman letter styles that slant to the right, based off of the italic hand that developed in Italy during the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. How do you tell the difference between cursive and italics? Here's a shortcut I use to distinguish the difference between these two styles of slant. Look at these letters in particular. F, R, S, and G. You'll notice that with the cursive style, these letter forms are completely different than the, the italic style. And they have to be in order to connect to other letters. Whereas with italics, it's actually a bit more of an unconnected printing hand. So you won't usually see the italic R, for example, as a connected form. OK, our last definition, entrance and exit strokes. Now, this is a pretty straightforward definition, but it's still worth mentioning, as I'll be using these terms frequently. An entrance stroke is on the left of a letter and flows in from the letter preceding it, or it starts off a word. An exit stroke is on the right and flows out of one letter and into the next, or it ends a word. So now I want to talk a bit about handwriting and lettering versus typeface design. And I want to address the differences between them. With handwriting or lettering, you can alter a letter form to better suit the adjacent letters as needed. You just simply draw it. With a typeface, you get one version of each letter in the standard character setting. You can still achieve the authentic look of lettering. It just has to be done through different means, such as with ligatures or contextual alternates, and we'll be covering that shortly. However, you still just have that one letter form that is the standard. Ligatures and contextual alternates are features, and they can be activated or deactivated. And not all users are aware that these features exist. So if you rely on them too heavily for your typeface to work, and one of these features is deactivated, 
Any problems that you haven't fully resolved in the typeface of standard setting will be right there for the world to see. As such, I aim to make the default setting work as well as it can and not rely too heavily on these features for it to work, which, um, yeah, it's easier said than done. And herein lies what I found to be the key challenges associated with designing script typefaces. Most connected letters work just fine, but there are a few that do not, and they pretty much signal the challenges and compromises that will follow. And we'll talk about what these problems are and go over a few solutions as well. All right, some of the features of fully connected scripts. The best feature of a fully connected script to me is that it tends to create even letter spacing and color. However, it's somewhat limited to cursive styles. I've seen connected italic designs, but there's a couple letters that look kind of odd when they're connected and don't really necessarily work well. The challenge with a fully connected script is that certain letter pairs do not work well together unless a ligature or alternates are introduced. Semi-connected scripts. The best feature of a semi-connected design is that it looks more natural and authentic as it more closely represents handwriting. On the downside, it can create letter spacing problems. Connecting strokes break up the spacing between letters, provide more color and word shape, and lend a more consistent rhythmic quality to the design. And without some of these connected strokes, you get, well, gaps between the letters. So they have to be handled with care. Semi-connected scripts are the most flexible to work with, and they can be used with virtually any lettering style. <clears throat> a quick note about uppercase letters. Most of the time, these are unconnected forms, even in an otherwise fully connected script. As you can imagine, it's pretty hard to connect something like the uppercase P to a lowercase letter. So let's talk about ligatures. Now, I use ligatures to deal primarily with letter collisions or conflicts and to handle the most important fixes in a font. Users are more likely to be aware of ligatures, and most applications allow them to activate or deactivate this feature at will. As a result, this is where I place the most critical fixes or the ones that will result in the biggest improvements to the design. The TH ligature on the left, now that's one that, um, it's, it's not necessarily a required ligature, it's a little bit more stylistic, but I felt like there was, you know, it was kind of gray area, and um, it felt a little claustrophobic to me having the crossbar of the T, you know, jutting into the H, but of course, if I made the crossbar shorter, it took out a unique feature to the font. So I went ahead and made that into a ligature, and it cleaned it up and at the same time added a little bit of style to it. The FJ ligature is probably the most obvious one that you look at and say, yeah, you definitely need to have a ligature to Alora. Um, they, you know, kind of collide into each other and look pretty ugly. So um, went ahead and did that. And you may be asking yourself, well, you know, why didn't you take that J that's on the, the right and um, use that as your standard or your default, you know, character for the letter J? And um, the answer to that is... <laughs> I just didn't like it. You know, it has this um, ugly looking, weird exit stroke, and I just thought, you know, this is, just, it, this is ligature time. Something needs to be done about this. Contextual alternates. So this is one of my favorite topics to discuss. I, um, I really got into this when I designed the typeface that you see animating down there below. Um, Hummingbird, back in 2012, really got interested in um, contextual alternates and how they work and, and what all the possibilities of them were, all the different things that you can do. Um, it's, it's a wonderful feature. And um, the, the definition here that I wrote, a feature that contextually substitutes one glyph for an alternate better suited in reference to the adjacent characters. But there's more that you can do with it than just you know fixing a problem. And it's another way to deal with less than perfect looking letter combinations besides ligatures. So again, one of the main purposes of contextual alternates is to enable better script joining behavior. Um, I use this to fix less important problems than those that can be resolved with ligatures as users are much less familiar with this feature. In addition, you can also use these to make your typeface more closely resemble hand lettering by doing a few things that I'll show you in the next couple of slides. Beginnings and endings with contextual alternates. Um, this is probably what I use contextual alternates for the most in my script faces. And uh, the majority of my script, script type faces have uh, this feature in them. I introduce beginning and ending forms. Uh, beginning forms are great for those letters with entrance strokes, such as the R, S, X, and Z, which start off a word. With an entrance stroke on the R and the S, they look more natural and they color more evenly with a longer entrance stroke. 
And then the opposite is true with the X and the Z. It looks better with the entrance stroke terminated. And then with some of the endings, you can shorten the exit strokes to look a little cleaner. And in some cases, such as the letter B, O, and P, the exit strokes look really out of place at the end of a word. And again, referring back to handwriting, we generally leave this off when doing any lettering or writing anyway. Consecutive duplicate letters, um, <laughs> kind of a fancy way of saying two of the same letters in a row, A, A, E, E, C, C, you get it. Anyway, when people are trying to figure out if a word or a phrase is a typeface or if it's custom lettering, one of the first things we look for are two identical letters in said word or phrase, like the letter E, which is the most commonly used letter in the English language. To uh, avoid this telltale sign that your font is indeed a font, you can create alternates of each letter so that if you have two of the same letters next to or near each other, one can substitute to an alternate. Randomization and stylized connections with contextual alternates. So before we get too heavily into this, I want to address randomization. It is a feature that exists in OpenType. However, as far as I know, there aren't any programs that support this feature. So at this point in time, it's, it's a bit useless, which is too bad, because it, it would be a really cool feature to have. Um, so anytime that you see any typeface that looks like it has some randomization going in it, uh, that was designed intentionally and programmed by the typeface designer. With contextual alternates, you can create more stylized connections or introduce alternates that do something a little different, such as uh, with this N in my font Hummingbird that drops below the baseline instead of connecting as it does in other places. I also use contextual alternates for a lot of other things, but that's a different workshop. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite topics. I love discussing contextual alternates and all the possibilities of them. Challenging letter connections. So what are these? Uh, for me, it's any letter that connects from the top that is followed by another letter with an entrance stroke. All letters have optional entrance strokes, but with connective cursive styles, it's, it's pretty much a requirement for the letters R, S, X, and Z. And the problem I've encountered with this group is in how they connect to certain other letters, such as the O, V, and W. And that's because with the O, V, and W, they look their best when their exit strokes connect towards the top of the letter form. But this creates a challenge when they precede the R, S, and X, and Z because their entrance stroke connects best in the middle or towards the bottom. So with this said, my approach to script typeface design is that the majority rules. The O, V, and W connecting to the R, S, X, and Z presents only 12 letter combinations. With the rest of the alphabet, we have the O, V, and W connecting to the other 22 letters for a total of 66 combinations. So with that said, I make it a priority to find the best solution for the other 66 pairs instead of these 12. So here's some solutions um, with connective cursive pairs. The ideal solution, of course, is to design the O, V, and W so their exit strokes seam up to the entrance strokes of the R, S, X, and Z. The problem, however, and this is purely my personal opinion, is that it's really hard to design this group, the O, V, and W, with exit strokes that will work with the group R, S, X, and Z and make them look natural. Um, again, in handwriting and lettering, we generally connect these groups from the top. I mean, you could connect from the top here, but then these letters, R, S, X, and Z, would look weird when they start out a word. So you're just basically trading one set of problems for another. Still, if you can manage to make this group, O, V, and W, with the exit strokes looking decent, then you've got a great design solution to work with. Another solution is to leave the O, V, and W unconnected in their standard style and then create ligatures of them when they're followed by the R, S, X, and Z. Uh, one last note about the O. With certain styles, like this one, the exit stroke isn't a problem. But if this isn't a style that works with your design, then you need to have another solution. Also, sometimes these, the V and R, exit strokes work too, so problem solved in that case. Ah, the letter E. I swear, my font Hummingbird was pretty much designed all around the letter E to try and solve this problem. Um, you know, and some people wouldn't really call it a problem, the letter E. It's, it's not nearly as big of a deal as it. So the next big question is, sorry. <laughs> ah, technical difficulties there. Well, I was going to say, Laura, maybe you could just narrate without the the recorded audio and just narrate oh, live. Oh, I accidentally clicked the pad. It'll go again. Hang on a second. 
Okay. <laughs> on the letter E, I swear, my font Hummingbird was pretty much designed all around the letter E to try and solve this problem. Um, you know, and some people wouldn't really call it a problem, the letter E. It's, it's not nearly as big of a deal as, as what we just went over, but it still is a connection issue that needs to be addressed, even if you decide not to do anything about it. And most people don't, because the workaround means a lot of programming and contextual alternates, and things get kind of complicated. So because the letter E connects mid to low at the entry point, the exit stroke of the letter preceding it must be low as well for it to connect. But this solution, this uh, low entry point in the letter before it, only works with the letter E and nothing else. So, you know, you can see that with the letter R there, with the, the N and the R, that, um, you know, that N would work perfectly with uh, if the E follows it, but doesn't work with anything else. So this is where contextual alternate programming comes into play. And this is also why most fonts don't connect seamlessly to the letter E. Now, you may be thinking, you know, well, why not design the letter E differently so it'll work? I've tried that before. In some cases, it does work, but most of the time, it ends up looking kind of like a funky little loop, and you can't really tell what letter it is. So the next big question is where to connect scripts, from the bottom, middle, or top? Connecting from the bottom. Connecting close to the baseline is best for when you want to have entrance strokes on all letters, which helps even out the spacing as letters with entrance strokes such as R, S, X, and Z tend to add more space to the left. But the reason why I like to connect the letters low is because connecting in the middle means you'd have this short little entrance stroke, which looks weird to me. Having a long entrance stroke looks more intentional in the design. Plus, if the letter isn't slanted enough, as this one isn't, it's, it's an upright script, uh, it won't really work very well unless you connect at the bottom. Besides that, middle connections are simply easier to work with, I found, and they allow for more design flexibility. Um, I think they tend to look more natural in all settings, particularly with the letters that have, ha that have entrance strokes, when they start out a word or are part of a semi-connected script. So now, how about connecting to the top? Well, um, not that it doesn't work. I just personally think, think it's a little bit odd, and I just I haven't found a reason for it yet. So I'm sure there is one. I just haven't found it. So it's something I never do. Control characters. So a question I get pretty often is, you know, when you're first getting started designing a typeface, what are the letters that you, you know, that you begin with? Uh, for me, it's, it's usually the letter A. I, I don't know why, I just, I like the letter A. Uh, but the second letter that I go to is the letter R. And that is because the R has an entrance stroke and a typical exit stroke. So since it has to work on both sides, um, spending time on a letter with an e exit stroke without paying attention to whether it'll connect to an entrance stroke letter like the R could end up being a waste of time. So this kills two birds with one stone. The next control character I work with is the letter V. And uh, basically, it's because it's one of the most challenging letters to design because of its exit stroke. My third control character is the letter N. And uh, this takes me back to when I was nine years old learning italic printing um, and in school. It was uh, something that is actually kind of a common practice in calligraphy to, uh, you know, as you're doing any lettering drills, you write, you know, N, A, N, B, N, C, and, and so on. Uh, the reason why I like to use the letter N a control character is because it's the average width of script letter forms. And, you know, as you, as you see here below in this example, it reveals how your letter spacing is looking, whether it's consistent or not. Optical adjustments. Script bases, for the most part, pretty much have the same optical considerations as other type styles, such as the overshoot needed for round forms, making horizontal strokes lighter than vertical strokes, and so on. But there's one extra thing to consider, and it happens with the letters that have loops. As you see here, it looks like the entrance stroke to this letter connects lower to the vertical stem than the exit stroke of the stem on the other side. It doesn't, as you can see by the outline, but if we want to correct this, it needs to be done manually by simply by moving the loop down to line up with the entrance stroke. I'm going to show you my process of creating a master glyph that will have both an entrance and exit stroke that may be applied throughout all of the other letters. It will seem a little bit tedious, time consuming at first, but if you do this right, you only have to do it once. And it'll probably take you about 15 to 20 minutes to do it the first time around. And after that, you'll get to be pretty quick. Um, I can usually pull this off in uh, three, four, five minutes or so. 
something else I want to say before we get going on this is that I work out all the connecting strokes very early on in the design. In fact, I usually only draw a couple of letters by the time I get to the step. Having connected strokes that don't work together, leaving them rough, even if it's in the beginning, I find to be really distracting, and it just makes it a little harder to work through your design. First, roughly draw in your letters, and um, same thing with the entrance and exit strokes. Just rough them in. It doesn't have to be perfect right away. Copy the letter and paste it to the right of the other letter. Merge or join the two letters together. Then using the knife tool, cut between the entrance and exit stroke. I tend to cut a little below the midpoint of these letters. Pull in a horizontal guide to the top of the stroke and pull in both side bearings to intersect with that top tip in the guideline. Next, we're going to apply a mask to both of these letters so that we're kind of marking them and have a guideline to work from. So now we have both an entrance and exit stroke that will become the masters that we can work from. The glyph on the left has the exit stroke we want and the glyph on the right has the entrance stroke. So I do a little Frankensteining by replacing the top half of the glyph on the left with the top half of the glyph on the right. And then delete the glyph on the right. To avoid a hairline gap between the exit and entrance strokes, we need to create some sort of overlap. So I'm going to create a rounded tip at the end of the exit stroke to start with, and then we're going to copy and paste it to the entrance stroke. First, cut the end off of the exit stroke and draw on a tip, keeping all of it within the mask, which is why the mask is there, to make sure that the tip stays within it. If any part of it extends past the mask, you'll end up with a bulge. I draw a rounded tip to me, it looks a little more polished, but another option would simply be to extend the exit stroke a little bit past where it was cut, and that would create an overlap as well. Next, we copy and paste the tip that we created on the exit stroke to the uh, entrance stroke. In the metrics window, type in two R's and view them at different sizes to make sure that you have a nice smooth connection, everything is working the way it should. So now you have a master entrance and exit stroke to apply to the rest of your letters. And what I do from here is continue to draw the rest of my letters, leaving the entrance and exit strokes of them open. Then I come back to this master form to copy and paste these strokes into them. So with that said, here's another little tip. In certain instances, you'll have to adjust the master exit stroke to work with a different letter, such as the letter G I'm showing here. How I handle something like this is to paste in the exit stroke in the approximate location where it needs to go, mark it, then move the exit stroke of the G into place. You may have to make some adjustments to the stroke and maybe the tip as well, paying close attention to the mask, but once you're done, this new exit stroke can be pasted onto the other letters with loop descenders. Did we I'm lose you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the main things to remember when creating a connected script to keep everything looking right. Work first with the letter that has both an entrance and exit stroke because they absolutely have to match up and drawing them independent of one another, say in two different letters, will just take you more time to get it all to work together. There also needs to be an overlap in the connecting strokes and if you add a tip to it, make sure that it doesn't bulge outside of the stroke that it's connecting to. Also, use the same entrance and exit strokes throughout all of your letter forms, even if your typeface has a lot of irregularity to it. Now, I just want to show you what is going to be in the PDF that, uh, if you'd like to have it, like again, just email me, hello at lauraworthingtontype.com. I've gone through and made some screenshots here with step-by-step uh, -step directions on each little part that you saw in the previous movie. So here it is.
And that's it. Thank you so much for attending this webinar, and now it's time to get to the question and answer session. All right. Hmm. You there? Well, now that our jaw our jaw has hit the floor, because <laughs> myself, I never saw anybody make it make it look so easy before. So, um, you get a good process I guess it's you? just me, but I, yeah, you know, I guess you my process. perspective. Oh, ahead, I usually, sorry. I usually get all the bad, evil things happening, and so I don't usually get to see it work really pretty like that. So maybe we should ask if anybody out there, uh, you know, has some questions. Maybe they're they're seeing the bad side too. The one thing I did want to emphasize when when uh, Laura was talking about the gap there and the overlap that we will see a white. Little tri a little rectangle or some kind of white little area and saying, why is that appearing right in the middle of the stems? And usually uh, correcting path direction will fix that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's let's show that real quick, actually. Let's uh, I'll, uh, mess it you up. You want to give us a live demo <laughs> in Font Lab? Yes. Yeah. So there's two things that you can do. Um, and what we're talking about here is kind of punching a hole out of uh, a form. So the first thing is, you know, you can start your drawing out by um, going counterclockwise, your first your first form, and then you draw the other one, what's uh, whatever is inside, um, or the first one is clockwise, second is counterclockwise. There we go. And if we were to do both of these clockwise, and let me see, hopefully this won't make a liar out of me, it doesn't work. See? So it's, you know, clockwise, counterclockwise for the inside one. But I got to be honest, I almost always forget about this part. So here's how you can fix this. You should go to paths. And this is very strange. And Jimmy, maybe you can tell me why they named it this. <laughs> it's so not obvious. Um, set postscript direction. And there you go. And essentially what that's doing is it's reversing this contour in here. So this one's counter, you know, clockwise, and then it's just making this inner contour counterclockwise so that we essentially, yeah, have a hole in there. That's mm. a really good question. And the there. answer to the answer to why they call it that is because it's called a postscript winding fill, which we always use the analogy of the marching ants are marching along, and when they get to a path, they spill out a bunch of paint. <laughs> then they continue marching. If they find another path, then they stop spilling paint out. Ah, but because you didn't have the you didn't have the proper path direction, they didn't know and they just kept spilling paint out. So they need to be told that when you get to the next path, do not spill paint out. So that's <laughs> the best analogy I've I've found for a postscript winding fill. Now true type, where it said correct true type direction, those are quadratic splines. And so it's really the same analogy. It's just that um, there are different types of, uh, let's say, things that come into play when you're doing the different types of vectors. So uh, bottom line is you just need to correct the path direction. Got it. So do we have any questions from the audience? You can type them in the chat window. There's one there, Laura, if you see that. Actually, no, where is it? Let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay. And... Oh, chat window, there we go. <clears throat> oh, uh, let's see, would you share with us the challenging letter connection that the OVW set? All right, so yeah, let's talk about that one a little bit more. So to me, the most difficult ones are, um, let's see, kind of what I was talking about is um, if you were to say O, R, O, S, O, X, O, Z, um, V, R, B, S, V, X, V, Z, W, R, W, S, W, X, W, Z. So this is kind of what I was referring to. These are these are the most challenging ones. And in this um, screenshot right here of Hummingbird, some of these have been resolved um, through the through the default. But what I've actually done in um, OpenType, let's see the OpenType features. I've actually gone through let's see let's see, W R S. Like this is one example. The W B Z. 
so in contextual alternates, as you can see, they don't really work very well here. This is, like I said, this is our standard. And then this is um, getting into kind of what I've, you know, at the time made to be the fix, which was to make beginning strokes on the R, beginning stroke on the S, and then to connect it from the top on the, um, on these ones right here. Oh, let me see, actually this one's supposed to be an X. There we go. Yeah, so those are the, um, these are like the 12 different um, combinations that I find to be, you know, really challenging. It's not so bad on the O, but sometimes, I don't know. I mean, I look at some of these connections and I designed this a couple years ago and I go, yeah, it's just not, yeah, it's just, it's just less than ideal looking. Uh, you know, this isn't how we would do this in handwriting. We wouldn't, you know, stop right here and then, you know, have this like short little stubby stroke on the R and kind of continue. So um, the other example of like the other 66 would just simply be like O, A, O, B, O, C, O, D. You know what I mean? All of these, O, F, O, G. And, and then you kind of go down the list. Um, and then you leave out, you know, the R, S, X, and Z. And then that's where you get the other 66 pairs. So there's a few different, you know, ways that you can handle it. Um, you know, with uh, Hummingbird, let's see. I think another interesting one to look at to what I did with Alfresco. So with this one, I just, you know, created a, a letter on the O that just worked really well. But I tend to leave, you know, things like the the V and the W, I just tend to usually leave them um, unconnected. Le try and connect the O, but leave those two unconnected. Um, sometimes easier said than done. Let's see, go back to, ah, where's my cat window? There we go. <laughs> oh, how do I look? Yeah, do you guys want to see this? Um, the Ruffin um, letter forms. And I'll, I'll go to what um, Hanukkah has uh, to say here about my workflow with generally large glyph sets. But real quickly, I'll do the, uh, the, rough, the rough script one because people, people ask me this all, all the time. And it's, it's kind of a trip to watch because I think most people assume that I um, have added some sort of um, uh, like some kind of um, you know, like a filter or something like that to, uh, you know, to make it rough. And uh, it's not actually the case. Um, let me see. Pull up. And let's look at Pominder. Okay. So here is my original letter that I've drawn. And I've copied and pasted it from, basically from Photoshop. This is what I do. I go and I go, oh, okay, there's my letter. Copy it you know, bring it into Font Lab, paste it in, and draw it. And this is how I do it. <laughs> Which I know, it's, um, yeah, it's very, uh, very high tech. <laughs> and the so reason you don't why use I, Trace? I don't, no. The reason I do it like this is, you know, you have a little bit more control, but you also get to see exactly what the original lettering was doing. And you, um, and I, the reason why I don't do a trace, and you know, when I was teaching design and type at, at the college, um, I would see students messing around with the, you know, like the live trace and the auto trace, and um, they would just, uh, they would spend forever trying to fix something. And I found that it's just so much faster to draw things out directly, like, you know, as they, you know, as you see them on screen, rather than to do a live trace and then try to fix all of your points. So anyway, that's how I do a, a rough edge. <laughs> As you can see, I can kind of blaze through it pretty easy. It makes it a little harder to to adjust things. You know, like if I wanted to um, adjust this area, you know, you're usually highlighting sections. So it, it becomes a different, you know, story there. Okay, so dealing with large glyph workflows. Oh, let's see here. Let me pull up something really recent. Let's take a look at... No, it's the Monty. Okay, so here's like what's the Monty. Usually the first thing that I do is, um, you know, I've gone through and I've drawn all of my default characters. And then, you know, I start adding in all of my extras. And I use this handy little marking color system up here to, to say, you know, which ones of these are, are going to be, you know, so that at a glance I can say, okay, all of these pink ones right here are stylistic. You know, they're, um, they're swashes and uh, things like that. My teal ones are uh, ligatures. 
um, true stylistic alternates, uh, you know, I'll do in green, for example, you know, a titling, which for me is in this particular case, I use the titling feature differently than how you would do in text. I use it to um, show unconnected forms. So I get all of these in here. And then that's when I actually go and, um, you know, after I've got everything put in here, then I start to add in all of the um, all of the diacritics for all of the different uh, letters and stuff. And um, yeah, it gets to be really confusing. It's one of the reasons why I leave the diacritics until, you know, these for the, till the very, very end is because, uh, you know, this is a 1233, you know, glyph set. It's, it's pretty big and it gets to be, you know, quite a bit to look at. So I'll usually try to manage it that way. Let's see. Let me see if I answered that. <laughs> Thanks, Adriana. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. Even though you don't use them, could you recommend, you know what? I honestly, I haven't, I feel really bad, Joe. Um, I've never used any life trace at all all in font lab i don't know anything about it oh, i'm sorry um you know do you know much about live trace in font lab jimmy yeah i was going to mention that um what you just did there was fine for laura but we get a lot of phone calls and emails that you have so many points there on a stressed font like you were you were calling roughing that uh -huh. you can actually kill the rasterizer and on your machine it works okay but you give it to somebody else who doesn't have enough ram and the font dies it so does. There's i want to also mention that we need to clean up those points a little so there aren't so many thousands of bcps in there that's one of the reasons too um actually why i go ahead and i draw things by hand because um i my wallflowers font um you know like that's a that's an interesting story where you know i I ran into problems with this. Um, yeah, like if you look at Wallflowers 3 here, let's see. And I believe it's this one right here. Like, take a look at this. So that is a pattern for lace that I drew. And um, as you can imagine, this caused a ton of problems. So um, I think I actually did start by doing a live trace on some of these in Illustrator and then copied and pasted them into FontLab. And it just, you know, I was, all kinds of strange things started happening. Parts of it were missing. And, and that's when I was kind of like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to draw this by hand. So, you know, I almost think that, that maybe in certain cases, um, you know, cause I'm not sure how Font Labs, how well it works or, you know, I haven't played with it very much. Um, I know Illustrators actually works pretty decently. So with a rough font, maybe that would be a better situation and a, a better option to go. Um, so Kelly, um, who is a friend of mine who I was talking to last night about the, the color marking system there, um, wants to know if I have a clean, rough version of the face. So, you know, it's it's kind of funny. I um, I almost always work backwards where I usually will letter the, um, you know, letter the font out or letter the, do the lettering and then draw it in. And I almost always do it rough first because that's usually pretty accurate to how the lettering looks. You know, you, you take a look at some of the stuff, you know, close up. Um, that's not really a good one. And you can see that there naturally is a rough edge around the letters. And so, you know, it's, it's easy for me to go in and kind of draw it like that. And then um, I usually will come back in kind of later and do a smooth version of it after the fact. Um, there's, I think there was once or twice where I went and I did a smooth version first, and then I tried to rough it. And I felt like I was really faking it a lot. You know, it didn't it didn't feel as authentic as when I was drawing it directly from the original hand lettering source. Uh, let's see. Oh, demo creating a swash, an alternate swash. All right. So a couple different ways that we can do this. Um, let's take a look at. Commander. So if I'm going to make, say, a swashed a swash letter. I'll make something like out of the G here. I'm going to go to generate glyphs. I'll say G dot or let's do G dot swash. Okay. So I would come in here and of course we're not going to need that tail anymore. Uh, and this is kind of a funny thing. If I don't have a drawing, I usually am going from a drawing. You know, I'm usually looking at something. Um, and in fact, these are some of my swashes. So I could actually I could actually use one of these right here and show you how I 
kind of bring it in. Let's do this one. Scale it way up. So then I would actually, it's, gosh, this is being kind of picky now. I try to um, try to do as few points as possible, but when you start getting to some of these really long curves like this, it just becomes essential. I mean, you you kind of have to add something in there to sort of, um, I guess you could say, support the uh, the letter form. So then, yep, I would just kind of finish drawing this out. And this is this is a really super rough version here. Try to keep these uh, points parallel as much as possible and the handlebars as well, which means that I would need another point here. And there we go. There's a swash letter. Yeah, it looks a little crappy, so let's fix that a bit. Anyways, <laughs> that's me being picky. All right. How was that? I would say oh, awesomeness. You, oh, thanks. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, let's see. So I always, I always, always, always use hand-drawn references. I don't know what it is, but there are some people, like I think Alejandro Paul, he's able to, um, uh, you know, he's able to actually like draw directly on screen, draw letters um, without having any scans or anything like that. I have no idea how he does that. My brain does not work that way at all. I have to have, I have drawings for every single thing. And sometimes they're really simple. I mean, I've had a couple of fonts where, um, I mean, if you were to see, it, it was all done on one page, you know, and it was just sketches, you, you know, like Spamonte was just formed out of sketches, for example. Um, there was some lettering originally, but but even that, I still have to have something to draw from sort of as, as like a template. It, it just sort of helps me through with that. Um, and yes, Debbie, I do use font audit. Um, I always take a look at that. It's kind of one of the last things I do, you know, as I'm going through, um, you know, I kind of draw everything out and get it to look the way I do. Before I move on to any, um, you know, say for example, I'm gonna use this swash right here and apply it to the J or to the Y. I wanna make sure that I've done it correctly before I go and copy and paste a form that it may have mistakes in it, you know, so I'll go through and do the font audit um, you know, before I do that. And then of course, at the very end, you know, it's, it's common for me to, um, you know, to go through and I, I literally go through glyph by glyph and, you know, do this with font audit tool on and take a look at every single letter before I finish it out. Um, oh, the dots on my pencil sketch. Oh, I use, um, I use Rhodia uh, paper and I love it. It's, um, it's a dot, dot grid paper. And, uh, R H O D I A. It comes in this kind of this iconic orangey yellow cover. It's it's my favorite paper. I use it for everything. And uh, you know, sometimes I use um, like this is tracing paper right here. You know, to get some of these letters that were for the Adorn um, monograms. Let's see. Yeah, <laughs> I like the dots too. Uh, did I miss anything? Oh, let's see. How do I maintain the realness or credibility of a handwritten script font? That's an incredibly good question, Joe. I, for me, I think that um, you really have to spend a lot of time up front doing the lettering and developing the style so that it becomes like second nature and you you get this like intimate familiarity with what those letters are supposed to look like. I think um, if you're trying to do something that's hand lettered or handwriting, if you skip too quickly to the computer, you're missing out on a whole lot of stuff, you know, because, you know, by then, you know, you're you're trying to think mentally in your mind, okay, so how should this letter look and how should these things connect? You don't actually have an experience of how they should. If you've spent the time doing the lettering and doing the drawing, it, it's like second nature. You you can have this like visual image in your head. Oh, yeah, yesterday when I was watching, you know, a rerun of Seinfeld, I was drawing the, the A connecting to the R and it looked like this. 
But like I said, if you sit too quickly and you, you know, you only do a couple of sketches and you go straight to the computer with a script or a handwriting face, I think you're missing out on a few things. Um, oh, the masking technique. Yes. So let's go through this one more time here. Okay. So pretend that this is my original, you know, I've, I've roughed this up. Pretend that it's, you know, um, I've just drawn it in. I don't think I have an image for that. So I would copy this one and paste it and say, okay, so now I'm going to work on trying to get that perfect. You know, I'm going to mess this up real quick. Do something funky like that so that we're not working with something that's already been done and is perfect. So copy paste, put it on top here. Okay, and then, and this is where the math tool is. I didn't learn about this until maybe like a couple years into type design, and I absolutely love it. And you can mask parts of a letter. You don't have to mask the entire thing. So say, for example, if I just want to mask this part right here, I just select that part, Command M, and as you can see, there's a mask. But I'm going to mask the entire thing here. So now I'm going to cut these two, kind of join them seamlessly together again. Let's see how that looks. Okay, that looks pretty good to me. And maybe cut those a bit, actually. Oops. That's a little bit more authentic to what I was showing you guys. Okay, so now come in with the knife tool, try to intersect it, and you can kind of, I'm going to fake this one a bit, and here we go. Okay, that still looks right. So now this is our entrance stroke that I want to be using. This is my exit stroke that I want to use. So I'm going to get rid of this top half here, and then I'm going to select this part, copy, paste. Move it over here, and I can just delete that out. And that's my master, my master glyph form there. And so that's kind of the purpose of the mask is that, um, and I might start with a. Sometimes I'll do like a new mask if I'm, because um, that mask, you know, I had kind of funky letter forms drawn. I might mask that again, so that now that it, when I go to draw the tip in. I can make sure that it, these um, handlebars, this one is, it looks like it's extending just a tiny bit. I don't know if you can see it, but it's actually okay. So long as this part of this outline is not extending beyond this mask, we're going to be fine. This letter is not going to do any funky things and, and start to bulge because now if you watch, if I did something like this, you see that slight bulge there? And then if we go to the metrics window, RR, RRR. So like a pirate when I say that, you can slightly see it right there. See what I mean? Are you there? Yeah, I okay. I don't feel like I'm worthy. I'm not even worthy to use the same product oh, that you sorry, use. This is a, totally <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, my regular handwriting. Okay, so that's funny that Joe would ask that because I actually um, recently did some handwriting for, someone on Facebook asked me that question. Um, let's see. There we go. Let's see if I can find it. Oh gosh, I don't know. I could do an example right here. I'll, I'll letter something with my tablet. Okay, let's make that 9,000 pixels. Okay, so this would be like my regular handwriting. A little sloppy because, um, you know, I'm trying to do this with a tablet. It's a little bit different than um, 
you know, than trying to write this with a pen. Okay, sure. Oops. <laughs> I'm so old school with this stuff. Yeah, there's my handwriting. <laughs> um, no handles on the entrance of the ending. I think I know what you're talking about, Jeff. Let me make sure that I know what you're talking about, though. You're talking about, let me see here. Copy, paste. As you can see, I've done this a hundred times. And you really get to be pretty quick at it. You know what I mean? It's something that, um, you know, it seems like it takes a while. But um, from the time that I've scanned something in to, um, you know, into Photoshop, and then I've started to, um, you know, to paste it, you know, like paste all of my drawings into the background, I can usually rough out the lowercase set in about an hour and a half is, is where I'm at right now on the average. Sometimes I can do it in an hour, you know, sometimes it takes more like two hours. And of course, that's not it looking beautiful, but I, I can, you know, by the end of an hour and a half, I can usually type out the quick brown fox, you know, and have A through Z lowercase. So yeah, Jeff, I tend to, um, and I think this is what you mean, and let me you know in the chat window if I'm totally got it wrong, but having a handle from here to here is what you're talking about or here to here. I I tend to not do that. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I'll add one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'll add one um, going this way. You know, I'll have handlebars on this side, but it's unusual that I'll have something coming out that direction here. And the reason being is it just it kind of starts to cause a little bit of problems with um, with how these handlebars function. Uh, you know, when you start getting small sizes in the in the M grid, you know, you you start to start to become an issue as far as being able to draw, um, you know, to to get things accurate. Like I don't know if you saw that when I when I was doing this. It's like as soon as I go to adjust this handlebar, it starts to get all wonky and crazy on me. You know what I mean? And it starts to do weird things. So it's almost easier to just not have that and uh, get rid of the handlebar on that side right there. And let me see if I got that right. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just not there all the time. I think he means the audio. Oh, Some okay. people are getting a little choppy audio. Oh, sorry about that. I was thinking, Laura, that we might be able to announce to the world that someday Laura is going to have her own videos on her own website, and they'll probably be uh, even better. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've been I've been kind of getting into that lately with uh, Camtasia, and uh, yeah, getting some things going. You know, doing a couple little you know demo type videos. That's been fun. Um, so if anyone's curious, um, you know, I, I don't know if anyone wants to see kind of what um, contextual alternate programming, you know, how I how I handle it. Um, I think that might be interesting. Let's see. <clears throat> this was something that took me for a long time to, to figure out. So this is my um, this is how I did my programming for oops, for my font Hummingbird. Here's all my, and it, it looks a lot more confusing than it really is. So I was going to type one out really quickly. Um, let's see. Let's go to Pominder, and I can do a contextual alternate feature. I don't know if this is interesting to anyone or not. So I've got an O salt. So let's say any time that we type an O, next to an O, like two O's in a row, I want to substitute the second O with this one right here, this O dot salt. So the first thing I do, of course, is I define a feature, feature, and then you type in, you know, C-A-L-T, contextual alternates. Um, you can find these features simply actually on Wikipedia. I mean, if you Google um, open type features, there's a long list of all of the open type features and their four letter, um, you know, their four letter codes here, if you will. So the next thing you do is you type in, you know, 
contextual alternate stuff uh, programming in, in Font Lab is actually pretty simple. It's just a series of substitutions. They look complicated um, after you start to add things to them, but the premise of them is incredibly simple. So I have two O's in a row. I'm going to mark this second O with an apostrophe saying that that is the letter that we want to substitute. And then I'm going to type O dot fault. Okay. Oops, supposed to have some features in there. Um, okay, so now if I go like this, O, O, as you can see, it substituted it for me. This is what it looks like without any programming. This is what it looks like with uh, contextual alternates turned on. And I just did all that in a couple of seconds. So, you know, kind of coming back to Hummingbird and taking a look at some of this stuff, um, you know, I've kind of wrapped these in, these features in um, what are called like lookups. And these, uh, these little gray things right here just basically says, um, you know, they're, they're kind of comments. And so they don't actually affect, and I, I put them there as kind of notes, you know, so that when I go back and I look at this, this right here starts to make a little bit more sense. Like this one right here is how I, um, this first block right here refers to the letter E and how I've handled that. So say, for example, let me go E, E. I don't know if you can see what happens here. So what it's doing is, you know, these are my two letter E's, standard letters. It's um, it's saying first, when the E is followed by punctuation, and I have punctuation, say, defined as a space, um, then add, then substitute this E right here with this form right here, E dot one end, which is somewhere down in here. You could probably find it pretty easily. And let's see, E dot one end, where is it? It's like a needle in a haystack. I haven't looked at this file in a while. Yeah, so there's my ending right there. All right, so substitute this by this when it's when this is happening. So you're kind of telling it, you know, the events and, and what order they go in. And um, yeah, and so it, like I said, it, it's something that it, it looks really complicated, but when you start to really dial into this, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, it, it takes some time, definitely. I think I went to print this out and it was like 12 pages <laughs> of, of stuff. So yeah, kind of fun. If you're curious about that. Let's see. When you're doing care. Oh, Laura. Yeah. Laura Bolter. Um, you know what? I don't, I don't care at all. <laughs> Actually, when I'm doing my lettering and I'm, and I'm thinking about the exit and entrance strokes, um, it's funny because I thought about this last night, you know, as I was, um, and getting ready to go to bed, I was like, oh, I, I bet someone's going to ask this question. And how am I going to answer it? Answer is I don't worry about it at all. I mean, I just draw them the way that they're going to be. Because the thing about entrance and exit strokes is they're very, very mechanical. You know, they have to they have to have this level of precision. They have to line up so perfectly that trying to draw it on paper, honestly, would just be a practice in futility. I mean, you would, you know, you could scan it in and then you would draw out your entrance and exit strokes. And unless you had, you know, pages and pages and pages of tracing paper and you were really carefully sketching it, you probably wouldn't be able to get it right on paper anyway. So I actually don't worry about it too much. Uh, the only thing that I think about is um, certain ones of the connecting forms. Like we talked about the O, the V, and the W in particular. I, I'll think about those and say, how am I going to connect these forms? Because especially the V and the W, they just get so, they're, they're complicated. So no, I don't worry about it at all. Uh, let's see. Anyone else? They do become complicated with diacritics. Um, yeah, I mean, because you really, you know, you're, you really kind of have to add diacritics to all of those alternates that get in there. And as you can see, you know, you get in here and it's like, Wow. <laughs> As you can see, all of these, um, you know, the, the yellow letters here, these are all my diacritics. And I probably could be covering a lot more, uh, like, you know, do a lot more language support. But, yeah. Um, let's see. Do I work with kerning classes? I absolutely do. Um, in fact, that's kind of what you saw a lot in here, kerning and open type classes. These um, at symbols signalize that you have an open type class or a kerning class. So um, something that I do that kind of makes things a little bit easier is I have a, um, and I won't launch word because you know, I don't want to take too long, but I have a word file that, um, that I have, uh, or actually, no, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. 
I have a, um, a feature file that I have set up that has all of my standard kerning classes. And so I'll say like, come in here, you know, reset classes. I can, I can open up my classes. And in here, like miscellaneous, you'll see here. Here's my features. They're in here somewhere. Ah, basic kerning classes plus uh, Central European diacritics, you know, dot FLC, basic kerning classes, um, kerning classes for all types. And I kind of will pull these in at first. It saves a lot of time. And then from there, I just um, I add anything that I want. And so that's something else. If anybody wants it, um, I have uh, I have a little packet that I've put together for a couple of people who I've, um, you know, tried to kind of help a bit with type design where, you know, I have things like basic strings of text to test with. And these are really handy. Um, you know, I've got like, uh, this is really helpful. This is a series of um, a, like a testing string from Leslie Kabarga called Kern King, and it covers almost every you know letter combination that you have in uh, in word and sentence form instead of something like this, which is you know I also tend to look at um, that. So if anybody wants that, you know, send me an email and and let me know if you want you know for me to send you my basic kerning classes, my basic open type classes, my testing strings. Um, I also have a way to do these diacritics that's pretty straightforward and easy. There might be there might be an easy way to do it, but like here's how I'll do something like this. I'll say like, you know, a dot end for example plus acute equals a dot end acute, and then it'll automatically pull in my alternate and my diacritic into a composite form. I think it did it way down here. No, no, it didn't because I already had it. Um, so anyways, that's another thing that I have as a text file. Um, it makes it super easy. It's a copy paste. So, uh, you know, I might be able to save you guys um, sometimes. So how do, uh, Hanukkah has a really good question here. Hanukkah, sorry. Um, how do lookups work? So I got to be honest, I, um, I'm not 100% sure, but the way that I was described how they work from Miguel Sousa from Adobe is that they're, they kind of work almost like wrappers in a way. You have, um, you know, like you have a block here, this section, like this lookup. If I took out these, you know, this lookup here, which is basically just removing that part, um, what happens is, and I, if I did this to all of them, I would start to get these rules interfering with one another. And that kind of becomes a problem, of course. We don't, we don't want them to interfere with one another. We want this one to work independently on its own, and then this one to work independently on its own. And so on. And when I did not, when I first got started doing this um, open type programming in here, I didn't have the lookups in here. I didn't have this language. And a lot of things weren't working. Some things were, most of it was not. As soon as I went through and added in just this little section here, this lookup, it started working again. And that was, that was awesome. So that's kind of the way I understand it. Um, a couple of other interesting you know, notes on contextual alternates. I don't know if you guys find this interesting, as interesting as I do. Um, and I'll share this real quick as kind of the theory and the methodology of them. And this is something I've, you know, discussed at length with some other people. The, the basic thing that you want to start out doing is you start out writing all of your, your contextual alternate rules, broad in general, and then you go narrow and specific towards the very end. So as you can see, I dealt first with the, the letter E. So letter E is the most common letter used in the, um, in the U.S. language and um, English language, I should say. And then I start getting really, really, really specific down here. Now I'm saying, you know, when the uppercase punctuation is by, you know, you start getting more specific. So that's one part of it. And then the other part is the way that you handle each word. So you kind of start out by handling the beginning of a word, and then you handle the end of the word, and then you deal with what's in the middle. And that's kind of the other um, theory, like philosophy. And just knowing those two things right there were monumentally helpful for me when I started programming all of this, the lookups, you know, the, the methodology, the um, general to specific, you know, beginning, ending, middle. Yeah, really helpful stuff. Uh, let's see. I'm an alpha and a beta. Yay. <laughs> um, let's see. Fog. I'm not too familiar with, um, not too familiar with uh, font, uh, font lab. Okay. 
So I'm assuming that Adriana is saying that she wants the the stuff that I was talking about emailing. Um, another thing too is, you know, I'm happy if anybody wants it, I'll, I'd be happy to send you this VSB file so that you can take a look at how I've done the programming in here. Um, I think that it's, it's kind of interesting. And I think, um, I once upon a time tried to kind of reverse engineer a couple of typefaces and see how they did their, their contextual alternate programming. And for the life of me, couldn't figure it out. And that's because when you go to generate a font, and I'll show you what happens here, because it's kind of scary. Um, so if I take a look at, where's my master files? I'll show you what this looks like. So once you've generated it, all these different things start to happen. Um, basically, FontLab sort of rewrites everything. And I, for the life of me, couldn't figure out some of the stuff. I mean, it takes out the way it took, it took out my naming conventions and renamed them all with numbers, um, like, you know, 39 and 2 and stuff like that. Are you there, Jim? Okay. Have I ever considered writing a book? I would love to write a book. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I just need somebody to, you know, to say, hey, I don't know what I would write about. I don't have to figure that out. Um, oh, on creating fonts. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. I actually thought it'd be really cool to go through and, like, beginning to end, like, sit down and, I mean, take all of the stuff. You know, I, I try to be really open with all of my work and not you know, at first I used to be really embarrassed about some of my sketches. I mean, as you can see, you know, you start to look at um, some of this stuff and you see how rough it really is. And I thought, God, if I'm going to show this to the world, it needs to be perfect looking and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I just realized that, you know, that's not really realistic. I'm doing the lettering for the base of the typeface, not doing the lettering for the sake of lettering and making it look polished and perfect. So I thought, you know, it'd be good to like show the good, the bad, and ugly and just show step by step the entire thing, like how I got from here to there, from beginning to end, everything else. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, can you demo the different types of points when drawing with the pen tool in Font Lab? Different types of points. Let's see. So the green ones are smooth points. Um, you know, you go to double click these, they turn into um, broken handlebars. This is why I like using FontLab for drawing so much better than Illustrator. I think that drawing tools are far superior. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, this one right here represents that there is only one handlebar on one side. There's nothing on that one, and that's why it's kind of that yellow gold one. Let me see if I've got some different ones here. That teal one. I've never been able to figure out what the teal one is. Maybe Jim can answer that. Take a look if I've got some different. I was going to say there's usually some purple arrows in some of these letters. And I think those symbolize that there's nothing in the middle of them. Uh, there's no handlebars in the middle. Yeah, can't see any other different ones. Sorry. I uh, hope that helps. More real sketches. Okay, well, here you go. I've got a ton of them here. So, yeah, these are my real unadulterated sketches. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> I didn't hear anything from, um, okay, awesome. Yeah. There we go. So, you know, here's kind of the way that I start out doing all this lettering is when I'm developing a new lettering style, I usually will, you know, spend a lot of time just sitting on my couch, um, you know, watching really bad TV and, you know, working with, um, you know, my, you know, usually a, a brush or a pointed pen. And and I it always feels like I'm drawing with my left hand, although I'm right handed. It feels really awkward at first when I'm trying to develop a new style. And I just spend a lot of time just doodling and drawing and not it doesn't really look like anything, you know, and then there's a lot of weird sketches on the side and people's phone numbers and, you know, stuff like that. And after I've kind of developed a bit more of a style, I go, OK, now it's time for me to create like a master form for me to work with. And that's where I actually will come in with the pencil and um, 
and start like, you know, kind of, oops, kind of start sketching, you know, how I want these letters to look in pencil. And then I go over the top of them again with a, um, this is done with a flexible nib pointed pen. And I create what I call again, like a master. So I may have um, several, you know, I'll take a look at say like Alfresco, which is kind of interesting. Which you guys might be surprised if you see. Uh, images, scans. Yeah, I don't know if this is kind of helpful. This is actually like where I got started with, or, you know, and this is the sort of thing I'm talking about. I'm just like playing around. Um, hopefully there's no bad words on it. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I wrote this word in this one and I thought, oh, this is really cool. That's going to be the basis for, you know, this new typeface of mine, Alfresco. And um, I scanned these all in black and white, but they're actually done in felt brush, like in purple and blue and brown and green and weird things like that. So these are some of the examples of me sort of trying to get it right. You know, does this M work? Does that M work? Um, you know, how about different P forms? And in this case, I went through and I did several different versions of each letter and then copied the one that I liked the best. Sometimes I'll Frankenstein it. I might say, um, you know, I like this section of the P, but I want it to go onto that P right there instead. And then I might, you know, like copy this whole thing out and uh, go from there. So yeah, a couple different different ways I handle that. Um, let's see. Sort of show these to you. This is um the monogram series, and it is just done with um pencil sketch. So as you can see, not all of this stuff is very elegant and you know very beautiful. And uh, like I said, I used to really be kind of afraid of showing this to anybody. Um, because it wasn't very polished. But again, why do I need to polish it? You know, that's what you do in the in the computer when you go to draw it. I could spend an awful lot of time trying to get it perfect there or use that same amount of time and use a different tool as in the computer to do my refining. And that's the way that I prefer to do it. So here you can see, I started kind of getting into, um, I already knew what my letter A, for example, is gonna look like. Now I wanna draw the swashes. Hang on a second. Yes, Jim. Jimmy G. Hey. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but my internet just went down and I can't get back on the internet at all. Oh, I so see. You know, I'm going right along here with everyone else. Um, in fact, just kind of, uh, in fact, I know that they can all hear me. I asked them. Um, so, yeah, just going by chat and so they can all hear me. What you can do is just uh, go whenever, uh, you know, people want to stop or whatever is your pleasure. I'm trying to get back on the internet. But the, the good thing is that any meeting has a feature that if the meeting just suddenly goes down, it will automatically save the recording. Ah, okay, cool. So I'm sorry. Uh, apparently, my internet, my router, or something's gone down with Time Warner cable has gone to La La Land. So I'm out of here. Ah, okay, no worries. So you guys go ahead. I'm going to keep trying to rejoin the meeting. You can keep going uh, as long as you feel like, I guess. All right, I'm going to keep going. I, I love doing this stuff. This is great. Talk to you in a little All bit. Right. Okay, bye. See you. Bye. Um, let me see. Did you say, wait a second, let me go back here. 